Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. This time we're going to be taking a look at the Jack 3 Design Bible from the Limited Run Games Collector's Edition. If you haven't seen the videos I did for the first two games, the link's in the description below, go check them out. This video is to also let you guys know that this Design Bible is now up for download on the Jack and Daxter archive. More on that later. So, let's get right into it. This time, there isn't really any info on Jack. There's a lot of concept art for him, which looks really awesome, but no real information this time. There is someone like Jack though, so let's start with that. It gives a short description of Light Jack, but it also says something really interesting. It says, His transformation also awakens something deep within the Earth that now threatens the planet with oblivion. This seems to be an aspect of the plot that was cut. Next it goes over his powers. All the powers are the same as the final game, except I found this one to be a bit interesting. It says he has a glide ability, where Jack can glide over long distances. Now, I know that in the final game we were able to use Light Jack wings to fly a bit, but from the pictures and description, it looks like we were going to be able to glide around the levels, sort of like Spyro. This is just speculation of course, but it's cool to think about. Again, we'll skip past the arch villains and look at some of the supporting cast. We'll start with Damus, as opposed to Damus. Anyway, it says here that the symbol of his power is his unique Precursor Staff weapon, which he took from the previous King of Spargus. So apparently his staff was going to have more significance to his character, which would have been really cool. And apparently Spargus was around before Damus was banished to the Wasteland, because he stole the staff from the previous ruler. This suggests that Damus wasn't the founder of Spargus. I always thought he was, I mean, it makes sense that he was. If he was the leader of Haven before Praxis, I don't think anyone would have been banished under his rule. Praxis is obviously the ruler to banish people to the wasteland as he did to Damus, so it makes sense that Damus was the founder of Spargus. But since it was never stated in the game, it's only speculation. Let's move on to Cleaver instead of Cleaver. It says that he was an associate of Cruz, working to bring difficult to find artifacts into the city. That would have been pretty interesting. If we briefly look at Jinx, we'll see that he apparently works with someone called Rain. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Anyway, if we look at the page on Tess, it says that she mines the Naughty Otzer while Daxter is away. It also says that fireworks begin when Daxter's semi-ex-girlfriend, Rain, enters the picture. So, I have a few ideas about all this. First off, Rain is obviously a character introduced in Jack X. So, is it her? I don't think so. What I'm thinking is Rain may possibly be Taryn from Daxter. Now, I'm not sure when Daxter started development, and this little theory of mine is certainly a long shot. But maybe during early development of Jack 3's story, the idea of Taryn was kicked around, a semi-ex-girlfriend from before Jack 2. Perhaps when writing the story for Daxter, this idea was kept, but the name was obviously changed because they used the name Rain for the character in Jack X. We know that Naughty Dog assisted with the development of Daxter, so maybe some unused ideas bled into Daxter's story. Again, don't take my word for any of this, it's mostly just speculation. This time, there isn't really much to say about any of the gadgets or anything like that, so let's just move on to the plot and story. This time there's a lot here four entire pages of text. The first page details the project goals, whether or not they succeeded in reaching these goals, like focusing the gameplay and fixing the difficulty curve, is another story. So let's just move on to the story synopsis. Just like the last videos, I'm going to give you the gist of it and discuss some changes. It's been a year since Jack and Daxa saved Haven City from Core and the Metalheads, but Haven City is still a war zone. The Underground is now the Freedom League, led by Ashlyn, with Torn and Samos as advisors. Then it basically goes over the KG War Factor in the sky, and how the people of the city distrust Jack because of his friendships with Crew and Core and that the High Council banished Jack to the Wasteland. It then details Jack's flashbacks to the palace falling, revealing the catacombs. Rumors grow that there may be precursor technology down there that could tip the balance of power in favor of any of the factions. It then details Damus finding Jack and company from the desert, and is forced to work for his stay. It then says that he meets Seem, the leader of the Golden Order of Precursor Monks. I'm just going to quote this whole part here. Seem believes Jack's coming is the great sign his order has been looking for, and, sure enough, when Jack pays a visit to the Monk Temple, his actions cause the fabled Daystar to appear in the sky. Seem tells Jack the remaking of the world by the Precursors is close at hand. Jack tells Seem about the strange Precursor catacombs he saw, and Seem confirms their place in the prophecy, saying they must descend those catacombs to find the Precursor Planet Seed, the deep place where the planet was first formed by the Ancient Ones. It then says Jack learns that Damus and the Wastelanders plan to attack Haven City for banishing them, and they ask Jack to join them. Soon, Jack's loyalties are challenged as he struggles with who his friends really are and who he should help. It says that Ashlyn sends an emergency message to Jack, begging him to help take and hold the catacombs from the other factions, as she fears that the KG and Metalheads are working together, and if they gain control of the catacombs, the Freedom League will be destroyed. Once Jack returns to the city, he finds that Vega has taken control of the Freedom League, with Torn and Ashlyn buying into his plans. Okay, so this next big paragraph has a lot going on, so... 
I'll do my best to explain it. So as Jack continues to fight off the KG and Metalheads, the Daystar continues to grow brighter in the sky, and Seam finally reveals that the Daystar is a precursor planet builder headed for their world to erase and remake the unfinished planet as the precursors intended. Now Jack must also find a way to awaken the planet's precursor core to save everyone from destruction. He finally finds himself deep in the catacombs of the planet where the secret of the precursors is finally revealed. Jack finds that he is a pawn in an ancient struggle for domination of the planet, a struggle which the precursors have orchestrated to decide the survival of the fittest species. In the eyes of the precursors, whoever wins this struggle will survive, while the other factions are doomed to death. In light of this, the power struggle intensifies between the Freedom League, Metalheads, Crimson Guards, and Wastelanders as they fight to prove their worth to the precursors to become the final heir to the planet. I've pretty much been quoting most of this paragraph, but I'm just going to quote this last part. Ultimately, Jack must face his worst fears, the loss of close friends, and dangerous hidden agendas as he tries to stop the remaking of the world and complete his final destiny. In the process, Jack learns the truth about his mysterious origin, who the precursors really are, and finally faces his ultimate eco-evolution as Jack takes his mythic place beside Ma as a greatest champion of the precursors. Holy fuck. There is a lot to talk about here, so let's get stuck into it. The first page is mostly exposition we already knew from the game, so we'll just skip that. It says here about the catacombs housing precursor technology and weapons, which will influence the war at hand. I think that this is a much better use of the catacombs. In the final game, they discover them at the start, then proceed to not explore them until the very end, which is kind of dumb. Next, let's talk about Seam. It says that Seam is a he here. There is a lot of debate about Seam's gender, but I'm fairly certain that Seam is a she. The Jack 3 strategy guide says so, as well as a few other sources that the wiki mentions. I'll post a link in the description if anyone's interested. Anyway, back on topic. It says that Jack's coming was part of a prophecy, and when Jack pays a visit to the Monk Temple, the Daystar appears in the sky. I believe this has to do with Light Jack. In the game, we get Light Jack at the temple, and on the page about Light Jack in this book, it says his transformation awakens something ancient deep within the Earth that now threatens the world. Now, I know that page says within the Earth and the Daystar is in outer space, but I do believe that Lightjack was originally going to be the cause of the Daystar. Maybe the Daystar wasn't originally going to be in space. Maybe the threat was going to come from the core of the planet. Who knows? Seam says as part of the prophecy, Jack and Daxter must ascend the catacombs to find the precursor planet seed, where the planet was first formed by the Ancient Ones. I'll get back to this in a bit. Then it says that the Wastelanders were going to attack Haven City. I'm actually glad they cut this, there was enough chaos in Haven as it was. Plus, I like the idea of the Wastelanders being survivors, whose goal is to just survive the end of the world the Daystar brings. Next it says how Vega took control of the Freedom League. Again, I prefer this to what we got. It plays him up to be a lot more cunning and devious, and someone who actually has power. Whereas in the final game, Ashlyn just fires his ass halfway through, after Jack was banished and everything. Why couldn't she do that before he got banished? Anyway, next is a revelation about the Daystar, that it's actually a precursor planet builder. So, I'm not sure how to feel about this. Back in the design bible of the first game, it says that the planets were built by the precursors, utilizing the massive precursor robots that we found throughout the world. I loved that idea. Now it's saying that there's a planet builder just floating in space? Now, we don't know what it is, but let's just assume the Daystar is a ship, like in the final game. So, a precursor ship is what creates the worlds in the universe? And then there's the point about the precursor planet seed that's deep within the catacombs. Where does this fit into it? I don't know about you guys, but I really loved the idea that the precursors used their robots to create these worlds from nothing. This just seems a bit... janky? Is that the right word? It just doesn't seem to fit within this universe, and I know that it's never stated anywhere in the games how the precursors created the world, but the idea of a ship doing it is just kinda lame compared to these awesome robots. Who knows, maybe the ship had these robots on board or something and I'm just a dumbass who's looking too deep into this, who knows. Either way, I'm glad that the Daystar ended up as the Dark Maker ship, which was set to destroy the worlds the Precursors created. It really paints the picture that the Precursors were the good guys just trying to create life, whereas the Dark Makers just wanted to destroy. Speaking of which, what the fuck is up with this Precursor plot twist? They wanted to pit everyone to the death to see who would not get killed by the Precursors. Since when has the Precursors been these almighty evil gods hungry for blood? I get that this sets the stakes high, but fuck me, I'm so glad they cut this from the game. The last line about Jack finding out about his origin and his ultimate eco-evolution, and him taking his mythic place beside Ma as a champion of the Precursors, is awesome, and something I would have loved to have seen them further explore. So that was a lot to look over. A couple of things to note about the story synopses. 
uh, there's no mentions of Errol, the Dark Makers, Rain, or even Ma, and nothing about Jack being Ma or anything like that. Just something interesting. Anyway, that's gonna about do it for this video. I'd like to remind you guys again that this design bible is up for download on the Jack and Daxter archive. There's a link in the description so you can read it for yourself. It's a really interesting read. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys next time.